Throughout its long history of gridiron excellence, the University of Notre Dame has stood tall as the cornerstone of collegiate football. For ten decades, they have marched to the beat of a different drummer, and in doing so, marched their way into the hearts of football fans all across the country. Since 1887, they produced a wealth of legendary coaches and players, who between them have accounted for a record seven national championships and seven Heisman Trophy honors. Now in their 100th season, the spirit of these legends come alive in the shape and form of the 1987 Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. came alive inside second year head coach Lou Holtz, who set out in 87 to accomplish four specific goals. First goal, of course, we wanted to have a winning season. Second goal, we wanted to go to a bowl game. The third goal, we wanted to play on January 1. And our fourth goal was we wanted to win the national championship. They came alive and tackled Tom Rader and the rest of the offensive line, who provided the leadership for Notre Dame's multiple offense. He always said that the offensive line has to be the leaders because so much evolves around them. I mean, we're kind of the silent mainstay of the offense, and we really enjoyed having the feeling of the team on our shoulders. They came alive in linebacker Wes Pritchett, who led a group of dedicated defenders called the No Name Defense, a title they would thrive on throughout the season. Nobody felt discouraged or mad that anybody was calling us the no-names. It was kind of an incentive for everybody to prove to everybody else that we weren't no-names, that we were still good players, even though we had lost a lot of starters from last year's team. They came alive inside flanker Tim Brown, whose faith and hard work enabled him to capture college football's most coveted award. I credit God with, with all my natural abilities, but I think people realize that you can't do anything without working hard and, and keeping your abilities to the top. But above all, they came alive in the students and alumni whose undying support enabled the Fighting Irish to not only wake up the echoes, but bring them to life. Notre Dame came charging into 1987 on the heels of their 38-37 win at USC that ended the 86 campaign for the Irish and head coach Lou Holtz. From the minute the ball went through the upper eight at the last play at Southern Cal, we immediately started looking forward to 1987. And at that time, I made a comment. I said, you know, I think we'll be a better football team in 1987, even though we won't be as talented. For Notre Dame, it seemed only fitting that its 100th season would begin against the Michigan Wolverines, the team that christened the birth of Irish football a century ago. With just four starters returning on defense, Notre Dame quickly demonstrated that it couldn't be taken lightly. All-America senior linebacker Cedric Figaro's interception was promptly converted into three points by kicker Ted Gravel. His first ever attempt for the Irish split the uprights from 44 yards as Notre Dame led three to nothing. On their very next possession, Michigan once again fell victim to the young but aggressive Irish defense. Taking advantage of a Jeff Coons fumble recovery, senior quarterback Terry Andrzak drove the Irish into Michigan territory. Two plays later, he spotted Tim Brown in the end zone behind excellent protection. I had a tremendous amount of time, which you know, I was happy about, which I needed, and I sort of zoned in on Timmy a little more. I had other people open, and I just threw up in the corner, and he did a great job coming down with it with a couple of defenders on him. Andrzak, back to throw, sets up, looks all kinds of time, looking to throw, man wide open is Brown, the pass intended for Brown, he caught it, touchdown, touchdown Irish, a leaping catch by Timmy Brown, and he was double covered in the near corner of the end zone. 
Notre Dame's quick start shocked the 100,000 plus who jammed Michigan Stadium as it jumped out to a 10 to nothing halftime lead. Starting the second half, Coach Holtz reminded his defense that Michigan would surely come out throwing. Rising to the challenge, free safety Corny Southall's interception not only ended the Wolverine threat, but gave the Irish excellent field position. It was Michigan's fourth turnover, and it would cost them dearly as Andrzejczak once again led the Irish deep into Wolverine territory. Sophomore fullback Braxton Banks capped off the 55-yard scoring drive as Notre Dame now led by 17. From that point on, the second half became a carbon copy of the first half, as Southall's second interception would also be converted into six points by the offense. Staying on the ground, the Irish needed just five plays to find the end zone. Freshman tailback Ricky Waters applied the icing on the cake for Notre Dame, who went on to defeat the Wolverines 26-7. Although it was a highly encouraging start for the offense, the unsung heroes on this day would be the no-name defense. Led by junior linebacker Ned Volkar, the Irish defenders forced seven Michigan turnovers. 23 of the 26 points scored were direct results of Notre Dame's aggressive defense. Above all, it was an extremely important confidence builder for the Irish, defeating the Wolverines in Michigan Stadium while recording their first season opening victory in four years. The following week, the Irish faithful turned out in full force to welcome home their conquering heroes. With hopes of a second straight victory against Michigan State, the partisan crowd of over 59,000 would not be disappointed, as the Fighting Irish brought new meaning to the term double delight. In the first half alone, Notre Dame fans would be treated to not one, but a pair of safeties. The first one came just two seconds into the game, when the Spartan receiver inadvertently downed the ball in the end zone after catching it on the one-yard line. While playing it safe cost Michigan State two points, gambling at its own end zone would cost the Spartans two more. Led by Ted Fitzgerald and Jeff Coons, a swarming Irish defense trapped the Spartan quarterback for its second safety. Irish fans would also be treated to a pair of field goals by kicker Ted Grattle, who in his home debut connected from 27 and 37 yards away. But two safeties and two field goals would prove to be just appetizers compared to what the talented Tim Brown was about to serve up. Brown at the 30-yard line, cuts to the right looking for a block, tries to cut to the outside, cuts inside, 35, he gets the 40, he gets the 45, 50, down the sideline at the 40, he gets the 30, one man to beat 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown Irish, Timmy Brown, 70 yards. Becoming the first Notre Dame player in 14 years to return a punt for a touchdown, Brown's 71-yard romp brought the standing room only crowd to its feet. But neither the crowd nor Tim Brown himself could have anticipated what would come next. Returning two punts back to back, it was one of those things that you really, you really dream about, but you, you don't think you'd never have the opportunity to do. And uh, once it had happened to me, I really didn't think too much about it until after the game when I was like, man, I, I returned two punts back to back. And you can't help but uh, sit back and marvel about it a little bit, but at the same time, you have to go on and uh, do the things you have to do the rest of the year. 
Lightning strike twice. High spiral. Drifting back ground. Ground to the 34, to the 35. Cuts up field. Gets to the 40. 45. He has the 50. Down to the 40. 35. 30. One man to beat. Down to the 20. 15. 10. 5. Touchdown again. Timmy Brown. 66 yards later, Tim Brown's second consecutive punt return for a touchdown would tie an NCAA record. And while Brown was busy proving his Heisman Trophy credentials, Lorenzo White was discovering the Irish defense to be not quite as generous. With White looking for his third 100-yard game against the Irish, Notre Dame's defense stopped the All-American in his tracks, allowing Lorenzo White a mere 51 yards on 19 carries. But the defense did more than just contain White. It shut down the whole Spartan offense, forcing Michigan State into four turnovers. The Irish zeroed in on quarterback Bobby McAllister, who linebacker Wes Pritchett felt was the key to the Spartans' success. We knew we had to contain Bobby McAllister. We knew that he was a great passer and a great runner, and he was most dangerous when he broke contain. So we worked all week on the defensive ends and the tackles containing McAllister and not letting him break contain and it paid off in the games. We kept him contained and uh, he wasn't able to move around and scramble and as a result we shut down their offense. In the second half, the Irish proved they could score in a more conventional way when fullback Anthony Johnson plowed into the end zone. As Notre Dame thoroughly crushed the eventual Rose Bowl champion Spartans, 31-8. Having proven themselves against 9th-ranked Michigan and 17th-ranked Michigan State, the Irish were now 2-0. And with Purdue slated next, the thought of a clean sweep over the Big Ten Conference had everyone jumping for joy. Week three found Notre Dame in ross Aid Stadium, where under the watchful eye of Lou Holtz, the Irish hoped to continue their winning ways against rival Purdue. Having won only once in their last seven visits to ross Aid, the offense got on track early as Terry Andrzak and fullback Anthony Johnson combined on a 51-yard bomb that caught Purdue by surprise. After Ted Grattle gave the Irish an early lead, junior tailback Mark Green and Anthony Johnson made it a 10-point advantage as Notre Dame appeared unstoppable. But the Boilermakers would hang tough. Rallying for 17 unanswered points, Purdue became the first team to score against Notre Dame in the first half. With the Irish trailing for the first time all year, sophomore cornerback Stan Smigala slowed down the charging Boilermakers on a perfectly timed interception. Despite Smigala's theft, the Irish still trail by three. Yet the thought of losing to Purdue never once crossed the mind of quarterback Terry Andrzak. We were down, but uh, the attitude of the team was, you know, we're not going to lose this. We all sense the feeling that, you know, we were down, but... There's no way this team's going to beat us, and there's no way we're going to suffer a loss today. And that was the funny thing about it. And you know, sure enough, the second half we came out and controlled the ball real well and went ahead. Behind 20 to 17, the offense quickly shifted into high gear. Wasting little time, the Irish promptly drove 91 yards in 12 plays to regain the lead. Anthony Johnson's third touchdown of the game ignited the rejuvenated offense as Tim Brown and Terry Andrzak immediately followed with a 44-yard touchdown strike. Second down and 10, Notre Dame from the Purdue 48-yard line. Here's Andrzak rolling to the left, looking to throw, sets up, throwing long, got Tim Brown at the 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Timmy Brown! With the game now in the hands of the Irish defense, any hopes of a Purdue comeback were put to rest by free safety Corny Salvo. The interception against Purdue, I would say, was a complete team effort. 
because the down lineman had a great pass rush. And as the quarterback rolled out, I just mirrored his release. And as he threw the ball, I had a pretty good break on the ball. The other players on the team just turned and blocked, and it was just it was just picture perfect. Everyone had to block the man, and as it turned out, I was caught at like the two yard line and fell into the end zone. And it was it was a complete team effort. After defeating Purdue 44 to 20, Notre Dame enjoyed a well earned week off before heading east to face the Pitt Panthers. Against Pittsburgh, the fourth-ranked Irish would taste defeat for the first time all season, and not without heavy casualties. Starting quarterback Terry Andrzak would suffer a season-ending injury, falling victim to a broken collarbone. As head coach Lou Holtz and defensive coordinator Foge Fazio laid down a new plan of attack, the Irish promptly responded behind sophomore quarterback Tony Rice. With the Irish trailing 27 to nothing, Rice rallied Notre Dame for three second-half touchdowns. Todd Light's special team play kept the Irish within striking distance. Mark Green's first six-pointer of the season would cut the Panther lead to eight. But it would be too little too late. Suffering their first defeat in four games, the 30-22 loss to the Panthers became a learning experience for Mark Green and the rest of the Irish players. Pittsburgh game really opened our eyes, and uh, we realized that we could be beat, and uh, from that time forward we knew that we had to go out and we had to play as hard as we can every game. For the fourth time in five games, the Irish took to the road, this time against the Falcons of Air Force. Welcomed with a Top Gun salute, Notre Dame would not be intimidated, for the Irish brought a Top Gun of their own in the disguise of quarterback Tony Rice. Lou Holtz immediately showed tremendous confidence in his young quarterback, who was starting for the first time. Faced with a fourth and one early in the game, Holtz's decision to bypass a sure field goal quickly paid dividends, as Rice gave the Irish an early advantage. Gaining confidence on every play, Rice once again led the way to the Falcon end zone. From four yards out, Rice's second touchdown lit a fuse under the Irish the Falcons could not extinguish. Using strictly a ground attack, Irish running backs responded by rushing for the most yards in one game since 1980. Led by junior Mark Green, the Irish tallied 354 yards against the overmatched Falcon defense. With Air Force unable to stop Notre Dame's running game, Braxton Banks put the Irish in front 28 to seven. In the second half, Tim Brown continued his wizardry over the Falcons with a 74 yard punt return for a touchdown, his third of the season. Brown going to get a chance to field it, he does. From the 27 to the 30, 35, he's on the 40, 45, could be at the 50, under the 40, under the 30, he's going to go all the way, 74 yards, Tim Brown for a touchdown. For the second consecutive year, Brown's extraordinary kick returning ability scorched the Air Force defense. And although the Irish were playing in Falcon Stadium, it was obvious people were getting the message about the talent of Tim Brown. Defensively, the Irish continued to excel. Tackle Brian Flannery shut down the wishbone on a critical fourth and two. For many reasons, it was an important victory for Notre Dame. But above all, the Falcon game represented the emergence of their young quarterback, as Mark Green remembers. He really matured a lot when he got the starting role because he knew that he had to come in and he had to do the job. And he, he really did. He came together with us and did a real good job. We're a little proud of him. Rolling over the Falcons 35 to 14, the Irish immediately returned home for a critical confrontation against eventual Pac-10 champion USC.
Having lost four straight to the Irish, USC entered Notre Dame Stadium determined to turn things around. But Notre Dame also knew that revenge would be a major factor, having defeated the Trojans last season in what many consider the greatest comeback in Irish history. Right from the start, Notre Dame knew it was in for a war as Southern Cal produced a 70-yard scoring drive on the very first possession. Knowing full well how explosive the Trojan offense could be, defensive coordinator Foge Fazio calmly settled down his defensemen. Becoming more aggressive, the Irish regained control as Trojan quarterbacks and wide receivers suddenly found themselves paying the price for every yard gained. Both teams so evenly matched in talent, the Irish were well aware that to beat USC, they would have to win the Battle of the Trenches. Rising to the challenge, the offensive line of Byron Spruell, Jeff Pearson, Chuck Lanza, Tom Freeman, Tom Rader, and Andy Heck began to open up huge holes in Southern Cal's front line. Tony Rice's 26-yard sprint to the end zone capped off an 88-yard drive as Notre Dame led for the first time 10-7. With the offense starting to take command, tailback Ricky Waters weaves his way through the Trojan defenders as Notre Dame continues to roll. From a full house backfield, Tim Brown coasted into the end zone as the momentum of the game was now squarely in the hands of the Irish. Riding the coattails of his offensive lineman, Mark Green scored Notre Dame's third unanswered touchdown as the Irish took a commanding 26-7 advantage. Trailing by 19, it was now Southern Cal's turn to try to pull off a miracle comeback. But inside linebacker Ned Bolkar knew the defense could do no wrong. It seems like everything was just going right. Our defense played well the entire game. Every time they ran the ball, I felt like we had 11 guys going 100 miles an hour to the ball. And in the second half, it seemed like no longer could USC even move the ball a foot. But while the defense once again put on an excellent performance, even it would take a back seat to tackle Tom Rader, center Chuck Lanza, and the rest of the offensive line, who CBS Sports voted as the game's most valuable players. When we got the award, it was kind of like we looked at each other and said, what? Are you, are you are you sure? But it was it was an enjoyable experience, and one thing that I always remember. Oh, it was a definite high, no doubt about that. Uh, you know, I think we played well up front, all of us. Uh, in a game like USC, it just magnified uh, the greatness of the win. Most of us up there, the four of us that are fifth-year seniors, it's the fifth time that we've beaten USC, uh, and I definitely think it was a landmark game in our careers. Of course, CBS wasn't the only one who appreciated the offensive line's performance. 
tailback Mark Reed also had high praise for his blockers. I think it's a running back's dream to get the ball from the quarterback and to see the holes and the seams made by the offensive line. I mean, getting the ball and, and seeing three different ways of going, you get to pick and choose what hole you hit. And the guys up front really did a nice job in opening the things up and really getting the momentum going on offense. Defeating Southern Cal 26-15, Notre Dame entered into the second half of its season with an impressive five victories against one loss. Playing the second of a four-game homestand, Notre Dame and the midshipmen of Navy met face-to-face -face in the longest intersectional rivalry in the country. Out of 61 meetings, the Irish have won an incredible 50 times, and with Anthony Johnson scoring twice in the first quarter, they were destined to make it 51. In the second quarter, Mark Green refused to cooperate with Navy's defense, turning what should have been a minimal gain into a 21-yard touchdown. For the rest of the half, Notre Dame's multiple offense had the midshipman defense chasing shadows. Tim Brown fought his way down to the Navy one-foot line before Johnson blasted home his eighth touchdown of the season. Topping off a perfect first half, freshman quarterback Kent Graham found Tim Brown amid triple coverage for a 51-yard touchdown. Here's Graham back to throw. Kent Graham, the freshman, going long. Downfield to Timmy Brown. Can he get it? He got it! He got it! Scoring every time they touch the ball in the first half, Notre Dame races out to a 35-6 advantage. Rushing for over 200 yards in the first two quarters alone, Irish running backs proceeded to duplicate that feat in the second half. Powerless to stop Notre Dame's awesome ground game, Navy's defense by game's end would yield an incredible 406 rushing yards, the most by Notre Dame in 13 years. While the offense showed no signs of slowing down, Tim Brown performed a little magic for Irish fans with an escape act even Harry Houdini would have been proud of. I think that one one particular play really surprised me. You know, I look back at uh, look back on film at it, and uh, I don't know how I got out. I'm not going to sit here and try to make up a story of how I got out. I faked him here, faked him there because <laughs> I had no idea how I was going to get out of it, and. Uh, it just ended up that they all overran me and I was free. In an amazing display of sheer determination, Tim Brown turned a near disaster into a 50-yard game. The 20, the 25, the 30, he's going to go all the way. He's at midfield, one man to beat. He's at the 40, he flips and falls at the 33-yard line. Ironically for Tim Brown, in what may have been his most spectacular play of the year, it would be erased by a clipping penalty. Undaunted, Notre Dame's first goal of a winning season was complete when Anthony Johnson, Ricky Waters, and Tony Brooks would all score in the second half as the Irish blitzed the midshipmen 56-13. In accumulating 630 total yards against Navy, it was the third consecutive week that the offense stole the headlines. But the Irish defense had been just as impressive. Placing Notre Dame among the NCAA leaders in forced turnovers, these stalwart defenders go by the title of the no-name defense, a nickname given to them by defensive coordinator Foge Fazio. Coach Fazio's uh, idea of a no-name defense was 11 guys out there on the field with one job to do, and that's to stop the offense. Whatever 11 players that were out there on the field that was their goal, was to stop the offense. Labeled by the defensive coaches, no names stuck to the Irish players who were only more than willing to stick it to their opponent.
Beginning the year with only four returning starters, any weaknesses were quickly resolved by the outstanding play of their young defenders. Like number one, freshman free safety Todd Light. Number 47 junior linebacker Ned Bolkar in his first year as a starter led the Irish in tackles. A feat fellow linebacker Wes Pritchett knew would come with confidence. Ned's really improved this year. I think that he really was lacking confidence more than anything else, not physical ability. And I think this year he's gained confidence every game and it, it was evident on the field. Of course, special teams play has always been a major factor in Notre Dame's defensive success. Academic All-American punter Vince Phelan averaged over 40 yards a kick, while his teammates never allowed a return of over 13 yards all season. Strangely enough, the following week against Boston College marked just the third meeting between the two universities. With the Golden Eagles making their first appearance in Notre Dame Stadium, the Irish defense quickly put out the unwelcome mat. In his first start for the Irish, freshman Kent Graham hit Tim Brown for 58 yards on Notre Dame's first play from scrimmage. Although the offense was experiencing little trouble in advancing the ball, once in close, Boston College would not allow the Irish entrance to its end zone. Relying on kicker Ted Grottle, the Irish settled for two first-half field goals. But Boston College had a few surprises for the Irish as the breaks began to fall in their favor. After the Golden Eagles added to their lead, tailback Mark Green and split end Reggie Ward would immediately team up on a 33-yard run that brought the Irish right back from a 17-6 halftime deficit. During the uh, Boston College game, I got the ball, I fielded the pitch on the option, and I looked upfield and I saw Reggie Ward and one defensive guy in front of me, and I knew that Reggie was going to get his block. It's just a matter of which way Reggie was going to take the guy. So I waited, and uh, Reggie pushed the guy to the outside. I jumped back inside the block and then tried to get to the end zone as fast as I could. Here's the option. Rice pitching out to Green. Green at the 35, 30, 25, at the 20, looking for a block, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Irish! What a beautiful run by Mark Green! 33 yards, 61 yards, 7 plays, and the Irish are back in it. But their celebration would be short-lived, as Boston College rebounded to take a 25-12 lead. This time it would be the defense that started an Irish comeback. Linebacker Flash Gordon's fumble recovery was assisted by tackle Mike Griffin, who stripped the ball from the Boston College running back. Capitalizing on the turnover, Notre Dame's offense began to come alive. Anthony Johnson fought his way through the Golden Eagle defense and route to his 10th touchdown of the season, cutting the margin to seven. Like metal to a magnet, Irish running backs were being drawn to the end zone as Mark Green and Ricky Waters put on an impressive display of open field running. Early in the fourth quarter, Braxton Banks evened things up for the Irish, diving in from one yard out. With the score knotted at 25-all, Boston College soon discovered they could no longer penetrate a surging Irish defense. While the Golden Eagles grew more and more frustrated, Mark Green capped off a 152-yard rushing performance with his second touchdown of the game, sealing Notre Dame's fourth consecutive victory. Scoring on all but one second-half possession, Notre Dame ensured its second goal, a postseason bowl invitation with a 32-25 defeat of Boston College. 
It was a victory to cherish for Lou Holtz and the Fighting Irish, as all America center Chuck Lanza remembers. We came back and uh, you know, scored on every opportunity. We had the ball, and uh, we just stuck our nose to the grindstone and said, uh, you know, we're not going to let this team uh, ruin our season. The following week, emotions ran high as the seniors would be performing for the last time in Notre Dame Stadium. But after defeating LSU the previous week, Alabama's adrenaline was also flowing. On their opening drive, only an exceptional play by All-America linebacker Ned Bolkar would keep the Crimson Tide out of the end zone. While Alabama settled for a field goal, academic All-America kicker Ted Grottle brought the Irish right back. The Alabama kick was in the air so long when I kind of got under it a little bit and started walking towards the line of scrimmage so I could get a better view. And I was saying in my mind, come on, win, please help. I thought I saw it cross the bar, but I wasn't sure, and so I was watching the referees. As soon as they signaled, I saw everybody jump up. That's when I got excited. From 49 yards away, Ted Grottle's longest field goal of his career even the score as the momentum was now back in Irish favor. From that moment on, Notre Dame completely dominated the Crimson Tide. Tony Rice led the Irish on a historical 80-yard drive, highlighted by All-American flanker Tim Brown. Brown's 22-yard completion enabled him to surpass Tom Gatewood as Notre Dame's all-time leader in reception yards. On his way to his third consecutive 100-yard-plus performance, Mark Green simply plowed his way through the Alabama defense. Calling his own number, Rice's 12-yard dash to the end zone gave the Irish a lead they would never relinquish. On their following possession, Rice again drove the Irish deep into Alabama territory, setting up what would have been a chip shot for kicker Ted Grottle. But Alabama jumped offside. Assessed half the distance to the goal line, Notre Dame decided to go for the touchdown. While everyone expected the Irish to run, Rice crossed up the Alabama defense on a play-action pass to tight end Andy Heck. The initial touchdown pass of his career wasn't necessarily a thing of beauty, as Tony Rice recalls. The first touchdown pass to Andy Heck in the Alabama game was called the ugly play because there was no form to the ball, just like getting the ball in the end zone up high, and it worked pretty good, so he took the fake. It might be called the ugly play, but to Andy Heck and the Notre Dame fans, it was a beautiful sight to behold. 17 to 3 Alabama looked to its all-America tailback Bobby Humphrey but unfortunately for the Crimson Tide the Irish defense also went looking for Humphrey against Notre Dame Humphrey's three-game string of 100-yard games came to a crashing halt but the defense showed no favoritism as they were equally impressive in shutting down Alabama's starting quarterback Jeff Dunn who only completed three of 14 passes. It was no secret, though, that the key to Notre Dame's success has been its ability to control the line of scrimmage. Co-captain Byron Spruell credits second-year head coach Lou Holtz for the turnaround. He came in last year, brought in a much more positive attitude. People know their roles, people know their jobs. Behind a predominantly senior offensive line, over the past five weeks, Irish running backs have averaged over 350 yards. By the end of the Alabama game, Notre Dame's leading rusher, Mark Green, had nearly doubled his total yards from a season ago. In a farewell salute to the capacity crowd, the Fighting Irish put on a fourth quarter exhibition of football Irish fans would not soon forget. Offensively, Mark Green got things underway on a 74-yard touchdown run, the longest of his career.
Any life left in the Crimson Tide was quickly taken away by senior cornerback Marv Spence. From three yards deep in his own end zone, Spence personally saw to it that Alabama would not cross the goal line. For good measure, freshman sensation Ricky Waters added a final 75-yard touchdown as Notre Dame handed Alabama its worst regular season defeat in 30 years, 37 to 6. He could go all the way. He's at the 40. It's a right for the goal line. He's at the 20. They're chasing him at the 10. They won't get it. Touchdown. It was sweet revenge for the Irish in what was undoubtedly their most emotional game of the season. We tried to refrain from getting too emotional for that game, but it was impossible to do. Alabama had beat us so decisively the year before, and it was our seniors' last home football game. There was an air of electricity on this campus that you could just experience. We played a great football game, and of course won quite decisively 37-6. to That ensured our third objective, which was to play on January 1. But just which New Year's Bowl game would not be decided until the very next week against the Nittany Lions of Penn State. In February-like temperatures, Notre Dame battled not only minus 25 degree wind chill factor, but a Beaver Stadium streak that has never witnessed an Irish victory. Hoping to catch the defense napping, Penn State went for it all on his first play from scrimmage. Senior quarterback Mars Spence more than met the challenge, though, with a one-handed interception that made things a little warmer for the Irish. But in spite of their early success, Penn State still managed to jump out to a 7 to nothing advantage. On its next possession, Notre Dame answered right back with a three-play, 62-yard scoring drive. Brown's 29-yard reception from Tony Rice was converted into six points by Rice himself, whose touchdown run evened the score at 7-0. Here's Rice on the option, takes it upfield, 30, down to the 25, at the 20, 15, he got the 10, the 5, it's going to be a touchdown, Notre Dame! on the option, off the left side, 33 yards, and a touchdown for the Irish, and it's now 7-6 as Notre Dame comes right back and answers the Penn State score, 62 yards, it is now 7-6, we're in the first quarter, 7.51 left to go. But Penn State regained the momentum, matching Rice's sixth touchdown of the season with one of its own. Still a lion gamble in the second quarter gave the Irish new life. On fourth and one on the Notre Dame 29, Penn State elected to go for the first down. But the defense held its ground. In stopping the Lions, Notre Dame received an emotional lift that carried over with them in the second half. Led by their young quarterback, the Irish came out of the third quarter doing what they do best, running the football. During their five-game winning streak, the Irish rushing attack had been virtually unstoppable, accounting for 21 touchdowns via the run. In the third quarter, Notre Dame evened the score deep in Penn State territory on an 11-yard gallop by Rice. 14-7, Penn State, Notre Dame driving. Here's Rice on the option, down at the 10, he's at the 5, he's going to score, he does! Touchdown, Irish! For the third time in the game, Penn State would overtake the charging Irish behind a late fourth quarter drive. With their backs against the wall, the 8-1 Irish were not about to concede anything. Having not given up their dreams of a national championship, they defiantly marched their way through Penn State's vaunted defense. Anthony Johnson's four-yard burst put the ball on the Nittany Lion four-yard line. 
Two plays later, the Irish dug in deep, setting their sights on a goal line that loomed just three feet ahead. As the seconds ticked away, Rice looked over the defense one last time before handing off to Johnson, who brought the Irish to within one. Unfortunately, the ensuing two-point conversion would come up short. Notre Dame going for two. Will Rice run the option? Will there be a blitz by Penn State? They're coming on the blitz. Rice in trouble. Rice at the five. Rice is stopped at the five-yard line. But Lou Holtz and his Irish players still had plenty to be proud of, having already come further than anyone expected. I never in my wildest dreams imagined that going into our 10th football game of the season with 31 seconds left to go and us going for a two-point conversion that we would still have a chance to win a national championship. Although they would fall just shy of their dreams of a national championship, the Penn State game made it official. For the first time since 1980, the Irish would be playing on New Year's Day as they accepted an invitation to the Cotton Bowl. From 25 degrees below zero to a balmy 85 degrees, Notre Dame's final game of the season took place in the Sunshine State against the second-ranked Miami Hurricane. In what has been without question the nation's most difficult schedule, Notre Dame's bid for their ninth victory would lie just out of reach. Frustrated by their last second defeat a week ago, the Irish came out hitting. Junior safety George Streeter kept the first period scoreless with his first interception of the season. But Miami would go on to score three touchdowns against the Irish while Notre Dame would be held scoreless for the first time in four years. But a 24 to nothing loss to the eventual national champions could take nothing away from their outstanding season. For the Irish still had a date to keep on New Year's Day against the Aggies of Texas A&M. For the University of Notre Dame, the 52nd Cotton Bowl Classic marked their fifth appearance in the postseason spectacular. For native Texan Tim Brown, the game took on a special meaning, for it was a chance to end his memorable career in front of his hometown fans. Head coach Lou Holt's 12th postseason bowl appearance marked his first trip to Dallas for the Cotton Bowl. New Year's Day also proved special for Notre Dame for it marked the return of senior quarterback Terry Andrzak. Making his first starts and suffering a broken collarbone against Pitt, Andrzak came out firing. Throwing four straight completions, Andrzak hooked up with his favorite receiver, Tim Brown. Together, the dynamic duo led the Irish 59 yards on their opening drive as Notre Dame jumped out in front of the Aggies seven to nothing. Showing no signs of inactivity, Andrzak continued his aerial attack in the second quarter. Using every available receiver, Andrzak found tailback Mark Green alone on the sidelines. Green's 24-yard burst set up a field goal attempt by Ted Grottle, who was perfect from 36 yards out. Unfortunately for the Irish, a series of misfortunes enabled Texas A&M to take the lead. Down by eight to start the second half, it was up to Notre Dame's defense to slow down the charging Aggies. Time and again, Texas A&M threatened only to be turned away by a gallant goal line stand. Although it was the first time these two teams ever met, the Aggies soon learned the proud Irish would not give up without a fight. 
But eventually, Texas A&M did score and would go on to capture the Cotton Bowl Classic 35 to 10. But by no means could a New Year's Day loss overshadow all the Irish had achieved. Given their schedule, the Aggies were really their ninth bowl game of the season as Michigan, Michigan State, Pitt, Air Force, USC, Alabama, Penn State, and Miami all went on to postseason play. Yet the Fighting Irish used that schedule to their advantage. They became a close-knit family, and from that unity grew a sense of pride and belonging, as tight end Andy Heck and tackle Byron Spruell recall. The team was close. We got a feeling of closeness and togetherness. We had great leadership from the the senior class and especially our captains. It seemed to me that uh, we did the things that we wanted to do. Uh, we brought back some pride in Notre Dame, we brought back the confidence. Undoubtedly, the Irish never lacked for confidence. They began the season with four goals and had accomplished three of them by their eighth game. Without question, they had come further than anyone expected and had worked hard every step of the way. I remember this football team as a group of overachievers, a group that hung together, a group that was very close, a group that worked for everything that came their way. Writing the final chapter to Notre Dame's 100th year of collegiate football, number 81, senior Tim Brown captures college football's highest honor, the coveted Heisman Trophy. It is now, once again, my privilege to announce the winner of the Heisman Trophy, the 53rd annual Heisman Memorial Trophy. He is Jim Brown of Notre Dame. I think you should uh, take a closer look. But um, I think it goes without saying, but I'm truly honored to be standing before you today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank, to thank my, my coaches and my teammates. And uh, I definitely have to thank my family for sticking by me through the bad times and the good times. God bless you all. Thank you very much. An innocent half-step of the quarterback's leg and the most dangerous offensive player in college football was sent into motion. He is listed on Notre Dame's roster as simply a flanker. But his teammates knew and opponents found out there were no limits to the talent of Tim Brown. Often he lined up in the backfield where flanker Tim Brown became tailback Tim Brown. And it was his running back's ability that made him so dangerous on the flanker reverse, a play he ran with great success throughout the season. He never returned a punt until the final game of his junior year, yet tied an NCAA record by returning two for a touchdown against Michigan State. At 6'1", 195 pounds, he was hard to bring down, and when the situation called for it, he simply ran over his opponent. He would help his team any way he could, even if that meant playing a little defense. From day one, he was the odds-on favorite to win the Heisman, which meant throughout the season he would be performing under a microscope. But he never once put individual goals ahead of team goals, which in the end had an everlasting effect on his teammates. He didn't let the pressure get to him. He didn't let all the accolades and uh, media hype reach him psychologically. I think that definitely shows the kind of character of person he is. Uh, he handled it very well. Um, and I think a lot of us admire him for that. No other person deserved the Heisman more than Timmy because he just embodies everything that uh, Notre Dame football player is all about. 
While fans had grown accustomed to seeing his spectacular performances, there were times when even quarterback Tony Rice was amazed at his ability. Well, he's unbelievable to me because there's so many passes I threw to him that she shouldn't, she shouldn't be able to catch him, but you know, he caught him. It seemed that Tim Brown specialized in the unbelievable, and when the big play had to be made, he made it, even if that meant paying the price. But it was his willingness to pay the price, plus the full support of his teammates and coaches, that enabled him to have such an outstanding year. Tim Brown had an unbelievable year, but then again, he's an unbelievable player. When Tim Brown became a Heisman candidate, one of the chief objectives of our football team and a team goal was to help Tim Brown win the award. We're very proud when he won the Heisman. He certainly truly deserved it because he's an outstanding athlete. He came to Notre Dame as a way to further his education. And if his football ability was enhanced by the school's reputation, then so be it. I'm not going to apologize for coming to Notre Dame. I made that decision based on my life, not on football. And the way it turned out, it helped me in football also. Tim Brown was the consummate team player, and he looked at his accomplishments as an extension of Notre Dame's return to prominence. The team success we were having was something really out of the ordinary. Not only was I playing well, but everybody else was playing up to their ability also. And once you can do that, I think, uh, you know, you're going to have great team success, and that's exactly what happened uh, this year. His talent as a player earned him the respect of opponents as well as teammates. In his four-year career at Notre Dame, he single-handedly rewrote the record books, leaving behind statistics of which legends are made. Although he will always be remembered as Notre Dame's seventh Heisman Trophy winner, he will also be remembered as the heart and soul of the 1987 Fighting Irish of Notre Dame.